Okay, so deterministic releases. What a releases currently looks like is can be represented very accurately with one picture. <laughs> I mean, I know we put a lot of hard work, but at the end of the day, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like to somebody who's seen smooth releases and bad releases and worked on a lot of projects. This is our process. This is precisely how it looks like. And chaotic. It is bad, it's chaotic. Like Jeff said, it is very difficult to get things done with our current process. It, wor it works for a lot of things. We designed it around probably a process. So it solved maybe a lot of problems when we, when we first designed it. But when we look at how it should ideally be, that's not how it should look like. We really don't have any safety checks. Um, things can break when we release. And we find that out one week after we released because somebody emails the mailing list saying, hey, so we're having a memory leak with this particular release, with this particular component. Can you guys figure out what's wrong? And we figure out, oh shit, we shit something bad. <laughs> and I've been here about May, June, July, August, September, October, so five months. And I've seen that happen at least twice. So it is a pattern. And we have to figure out how we are going to fix this pattern. It is not one-off. It is, if we didn't have it, it's not that we did something good, it's just that we got lucky. Or we didn't do something bad. That's pretty much it. So, oops. Um, in sort of summary, our releases are chaotic. There are really no safety checks. And the third point is very important because a large part of our testing is dependent <coughs> on maintainers. So I see this email that is sent out saying, this particular release is now ready for testing. Maintainers, please test and get back to us. What happens is, if you're the maintainer of one component, you test how well that component works. You really are probably not going to test how well it works with the other component. So if you maintain any component, and I don't know which ones to call out. I don't want to name and shame anyone. You're not testing if these two things work well together. It may not. It often does not. Um, I have seen that we have bugs when two different components work together, which are probably supposed to work together, but we don't really test it. And this leads to a situation every time, or most of the times. This is my ideal dream world. We'll never get there, but this is sort of the destination we want to get, because this is a moving target. We are never going to hit it. But this is what we this is the place where we want to be or very close to be at any <coughs> given point in time. Um, we had this staff a long time ago. Uh, QE uses it. QE is abandoning it for Glusto. They had tests based on it, but in upstream we never had anything. We had a couple of pieces of work done to do something about it, but it really didn't get anywhere, probably because of the lack of momentum. I mean, there could be a lot of reasons. I'm not going into the reasons, but the fact is we don't have something that tests if our nightly master is stable. We have regression tests, which, as Jeff said, is not really a test. I mean, it fails about five times every patch. How many people have submitted a patch without doing recheck at least once? At least once. Yes, you're calling it lucky. <laughs> so, at least once you're doing a recheck, most of the time. And most of the time it's not just once, it's three times, four times. I've seen how NetBase used to be when you're like rechecking it five times, and then finally it passes, and then you realize that you have to make this one code change, and now you have to repeat the cycle all over again. Our regression tests, I have not included it here because I'd like them to be thrown out, but that is not my decision to make. Um, there is a significant amount of code there. It may be useful. My approach to that is different. My approach to that is figuring out numbers of which are the tests that fail quite a lot and seeing if we can fix them. Maybe that's a short-term fix. Maybe that might help us salvage what's left, what's, you know, what we have in regression tests. 
if that works, great. If that doesn't work, then you know we'll have to figure figure out something else. And functional tests. So I come from Python, and when you test in Python, you don't just test or how the language forces you to test is if you have a really bad failure, you make sure that the code that's handling that failure is also tested. So it's, it's maybe a code path you hit in one in a hundred times, but is, are all the code paths that your code is supposed to hit, are you testing all of these cases? I'm not sure we do because our tests are more or less a full stack. I don't think we have like a lower stack test. We don't, do we have unit tests? Do we? We have unit test framework. <laughs> <laughs> we do? <laughs> and um, scenario tests. So this is my way of telling, if we tell our community this is what Gluster is good for, we should probably make sure it is good for that. And we should probably make sure that over releases, we haven't broken all the features that give you, like that you used to, you know, build that scenario for your infrastructure. Um, you know, if you say it's good for video ar archival, do we actually test that load? Do we test that when you try it with the cluster 3.7 versus 3.8, there's a memory leak? Do you test that it's suddenly slower? We don't, and we should do something about it. And upgrade tests. So I had this long chat with Kaushal a couple of weeks ago, and I realized that a lot of this is done, but is manual which is uh, not the best place to be in. I'm glad we're doing it, but on the other hand, it's also a very painful process to do something like this manually. I am hoping that Jonathan Holloway has a solution for me here, eventually. Ah, there he is. <laughs> I see that I've woken you up. <laughs> yes, hang on. Uh, can you give me the mic? We have mic for this session. Last talk of the day, no, there's only like half an hour with yeah, the battery on the mic. Battery, so. so. Ah, that's why. Right. We'll talk later. Okay. I'm trying to be brief. So, uh, two comments. The first one, these, these manual tests, I think you're referring to, are most of them downstream, right? No, uh, we have, I think, release managers doing it. Okay, but that's for the release in the release cycle. Yes. Not nightly or something. Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so okay, fine. But so, my point is, we should automate running. that. That's true. And the second point? Is, um, regarding, I mean, I was kind of shocked when you said um, throw out the regression test. I mean, that these are, I mean, these are supposed to achieve some of the things that are listed here, and uh, it, it was not constant. I mean, it has been decreasing or been getting worse over the past few months or couple of months. And um, I think that these things are not failing consistent, con consistently, but, but fla being flaky is not necessarily a sign of the, the tests being bad, but it can be like subtle bugs or errors in the code, in the actual cluster code, that is just race condition and so on. So, I agree. throwing out is, I think, the wrong move. Yes, which okay. is why I didn't actually say we should throw them out. I think we should throw them out, but we probably shouldn't. My approach ah, to okay. fix them is get numbers for which are the tests which fail a lot, and then fix them. Yes. One hang on, hang on, Mike, Mike. So one can take up just caution on like uh, tossing uh, integration tests in favor of going crazy with unit tests. As soon as you see a lot of projects that go crazy on unit tests and then you want to refactor, uh, people start to make bad calls on refactoring because they don't want to refactor anymore because now all the unit tests are broken and then the code winds up being you know complete garbage after a while because no one wants to refactor because there's like thousands of unit tests that will break. Right. So. You know, so they're you know they're not the panacea either. Is all I'm saying. Because in the long run, you can screw yourself just. Yeah. So, okay. So the next slide will actually explain what I'm talking about. Um, it's more in the lines of throughout what we have and how we write regression tests and what framework we write it in, as opposed to throwing out the entire concept of the regression test. We still have the same thing. We'd probably take a couple of cycles to convert them all, but it is work that we'd have to do to reach a certain place where the tests are easy to write, the tests are easy to read, um, the tests are easy to debug, because we have, all of these things are not currently easy. And this is coming from somebody who gets pinged when a test fails. And I look at it and I go, 
I have no idea what's going on here. Let me figure out what's in the bash script. And I realized that doesn't really help me much. And then it took me a long time to learn that there's a tarball file, which has a collection of tarball files, which probably has a file which you want to look at, which will give you the output of the console, which is a little difficult. And yeah, upgrade tests. So um, actually, I should talk about it in the next slide. So this is going to take us some time to reach there. It's, we are probably not even at the start line right now. We are quite a bit behind. Um, there's a lot of things that we've kicked off in the last couple of months by different people. Um, the distaff conversation has evolved into Glusto, and Jonathan will be talking about it tomorrow. So I feel like that may be a possible solution. Sham is leading performance testing, which again, is it takes it's going to take a couple of weeks to get to any state where we can get it useful at the bare minimum it's not at a state where you can say i made this change is our performance better for with this particular patch or not because we don't have that many physical machines we have limitations but we can start off things now we can probably head in the direction <coughs> that we want to be we can get closer to our goal but not at the goal So, um, Glassdoor is a framework that Jonathan wrote, and he's going to speak about it tomorrow. Um, how do I test with it? I, I like the idea because it is Python unit test frameworks glued together to run over a network, which is which pretty much fits our needs, I believe. I could be wrong. I am not a Glassdoor developer. I'm a sysadmin and a Python developer. That's all I claim to be. Um, what we do get is Red Hat is committed to um, upstreaming their tier one tests. So we get tests to make sure that Gluster will install and run. It is good to have because that is manual. We can automate it. And we have basic sanity. What we do on top of that is a decision that we all get to make, or rather everybody else in the room other than me get to make. I get to run it. That's pretty much it. And performance testing um, is, it's not meant to, at this point, let you tell you if your patch will make things better or worse. It will tell us if things have improved week on week. That's our goal when we start. It needs actual physical machines. These are not easy to get. Um, we'll be testing on hardware that is internal. The plan is we'll publish um, the code that we use to run the tests, and we'll publish the numbers. And our hope is that if other people want to run the same tests and give us the numbers, you know, we'll accept them. We'll publish them together. And then the performance and number, numbers are not coming just from us. It's coming from an independent source as well. And if the graph dips, yes, there is a real performance regression. It's not just our infrastructure gone bad. And if the graph is going up, you know, we've made performance improvements. We are not faking it. Other people can reproduce the same um, performance improvements in their lab. That's where we're going with it for now. We may expand on it, but that <coughs> depends a lot on things that I have no control over. It depends on getting servers. It depends on having time to control them in a way that we can run regressions. And these are not cheap. So getting the budget for them is difficult. And scenario testing. This is something I haven't talked to anybody about, and but what I strongly believe we should do. I think we should sit down and define the basic scenarios that we claim Gluster will work. And we should write automated tests for it. So cautions run automated like manual tests for things, and I think release manager is supposed to run it. Are you running them? Yes? Are you testing Gluster before you release? Yeah. Yes, this is the core of what I was talking about. So we need to be testing the scenarios that we think cluster is good for, and we need to confirm that it's still good for just before we release. Ideally, we should be doing this every week, but you know, it's going to take us time to develop these tests. It's going to take us time to get to a state where we can run them weekly. And 
it will take time, but I think these are things that we should prioritize um, because this is eventually going to get us to a state where our releases are dependable and we have confidence in releasing things. We don't have to wait on somebody to tell us that, yes, I'm the maintainer for this component. I've tested it and it works. You have an independent verification that, yes, this feature works. So that's my talk. It's all of it. And we have time for questions and we have a mic. So if you have questions, now is a good time. Yes, no? Question: What kind of um, you mentioned that you're short on hardware? Um, what kind of hardware do you guys have available for testing? Just curious. So, like what, like order of magnitude? We just have four physical machines. We can't run performance testing with just those machines. They are not in a configuration we recommend for production cluster instances. So it doesn't make sense to run performance testing on them. We don't have a good enough network infrastructure on those machines. So, yeah, that's where we're lacking. So it's network more than machines, actually. Just to be clear, you're talking about upstream. Really. I'm talking about upstream, yes. yes. So, Nigel, so we can use this end to SCI, and we can... No, we can't. No? I went down that path. Okay, because they actually... They only have one... Looking into improving... No. Uh, for our request. I checked. Yeah? Yeah. Ah. Okay. Well, I went down this path. I've mm -hmm. had conversations with them. And they do not have or plan to have network infrastructure that will help us do that. So this is something that I've thoroughly explored. Okay. They've given us an exception, but that still doesn't help. Yes? I would think that would help you with the scenario. <laughs> so uh, you want to see if there is regression? Why do we need fast network? Because if there is something that like 50% of regression, we will notice even if it's on second C of uh, on a crappy network. And yeah, we so not as fast as before. These are two different things. Performance testing requires its own hardware. That is not where we will run regressions. Regressions will run on where we currently run them. We will not move them to a faster network. We don't intend to. But performance needs to run on a fast network because that is what we recommend cluster to run on. That's the only reason we're running it on that network. And uh, how fast should the network be? Because we have uh, actually 10 gigabytes in the data center. Where is Manoj? Manoj? Ah, there you go. Talk to him. <laughs> How fast should the network be? How fast should the network be? Yes. Okay. I think we recommend... Uh, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we recommend uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet. these tests just on single machines like uh, you know which will have crazy low latency uh, just like set up 10 bricks against uh, RAM disk uh, so maybe need maybe some more memory heavy machines because uh, I've seen those like just simple tests like that can often really exercise cluster because like the latencies are like artificially crazy low and that's how you can like really drive out some race conditions that maybe one in a zillion in production, but, you know, with, you know... So, here's ways. what we currently do. The regressions currently run on one machine. They run on one machine with multiple bricks. We are planning to get to a stage where we'll have tests that run across a cluster. We are not there yet. But I'm just saying, like, try, like... I think that is a good idea, yes. Yeah, one machine yes. a lot of bricks. So okay. And, and, you know, against DRAM and... So, we have a performance buff, so... Be happy to do that. <laughs> no? Okay. Wait, I'm Lewis? Sorry, Brian. <laughs> 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 uh, just a simple thing. I was just going to say that you could use the CentOS systems for the. I plan to. For the I plan to. <laughs> I plan to. Yeah. So I have the job ready. I am waiting for the test to be ready, which is waiting on Jonathan to finish them. Well, one of the things I was going to suggest is that the developers write the test. They are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But this is the initial seed of tests. Okay. So. One, one last thing. 
Sure. Wait, I have one more. <laughs> so what, what is more for developers is like think about even like fault injection you can write when you write features. So like for locking you do think about fault injection like uh, what we did is we had things like drop random uh, unlock requests to kind of test for lock recovery. So if you're writing a feature just think about like how you can make testing easier by creating some sort of fault injection for your feature. Okay. Um, I think that would really help like harden Gluster. Uh, because those, there, we all know, but there's like certain failures that we all know can happen, but they're just super hard to repro, and uh, I think stuff like that. I think we should talk after the talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>